I'm now in the situation where I have to introduce myself. Um, my name is Gerald Mills. I'm a geographer at UCD. Uh, I'm a physical geographer, so all geographers start off by explaining themselves. I'm a physical geographer. And in fact, I'm a climatologist. And in fact, I focus my climatology efforts on the climates of cities. So it's almost impossible to study the climate of a city without studying both the human-made landscape, but also the natural landscape. And the, as I said, the reason why we were having this meeting today was because uh, UCD is engaged with the four local authorities to try and come up with a measure of the tree canopy coverage across Dublin. And that's what I'm going to speak about now. I won't be able to have a definitive map for the entire area, but I'll show you a map for the portion that we've completed. I'd like to say that this work is an outcome of a long process that involves other people. I have a very close working relationship with the uh, Maynooth University, and you'll see I'll refer to each of these individuals at time because it's their work I'm drawing upon. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce the state of knowledge of trees that we know already in Dublin. I'm going to talk about evaluate the ecosystems of trees based upon the data we already have. I'm going to show progress on measuring the tree canopy cover of Dublin, and then finally I'm just going to tell you what the next steps are. Now I see this project has been integrated in a broader process that myself and my colleagues at Maynooth University are involved in, which is to try and understand the urban environment in its completeness. So it's not just about vegetation, it's about the built environment also. Um, so what's the purpose of the project? It is literally to provide an assessment of the tree canopy cover across the entire Dublin region. This is the entire Dublin region, which includes South, sorry, Dunley Rat Down, South Dublin County Council, Dublin City, and Fingal. This is the Crin land cover data set. I didn't put up the legend, the legend's quite extensive, but essentially everything that you see here in red and purple, that's essentially part of the urban landscape. Large parts of the county you can see are substantially rural. And that's true both on the north side of the city and also in the mountainous area in Dunley Rat Down and also in South County Dublin. So having provided the tree canopy coverage, what we're going to try and do is assess the uh, functions that they provide, primarily with regard to the atmosphere, and then we're going to compare the tree canopy cover in Dublin against other comparative cities around Europe and elsewhere. So what do we actually have? Well, the existing data sets in Ireland consist of what's known as the FIPS data set, which are the these areas here, which are shape files that describe a, essentially quilture land and also private forests. Apart from that, we've got information on street trees. The areas that I show here in green here are the street trees in Fingal, which Fingal County Council have already done. This big mass of red dots you see in here are essentially the materials that UCD Geography, working with colleagues, have put together. It includes the city centre and almost like a typewriter, you can see extending out to different parts of the city. There's little patches there, that's UCD. And that little patch there is around a school in South County Dublin that I chose because we had other data associated with it. So the information we have is a variety of types. For example, inside the city centre here, we have the individual tree canopies digitised, all of them. And for all the trees which are on streets, a colleague of mine, Tina Ningal, went out and individually interviewed every one of those trees measured their width, their height, identified the species. We have similar type of information for this area here, which is around Merino, which interestingly was supposed to be um, a representation of Ebenezer's garden city in Dublin. Um, we have that type of information here for the street trees around a school located in um, just outside Turnure Temple Oak. And we have that type of information for parts of UCD campus, which is quite vegetated. Elsewhere, we have the locations of trees, but we don't have any other details associated with them. So this information consists of information that was derived bottom-up, in other words, exploratory, on the ground, and then information that was largely gathered by use of satellite information, chiefly Google Earth. So what have we found? Well, this is the information that Tina Ningle would have found for the city centre. So that's the uh, Grand Canal, the Royal Canal, and these are all the individual trees, and what we've done is identified essentially the density of trees across the city centre. So about 7%, sorry, 6% of the city centre is covered by tree canopy. You can see immediately where the patches are. Uh, that's the edge of Phoenix Park there, of course, is Stevens Green, uh, Marion Square, Trinity. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens with the development of the campus of 
DIT, sorry, in Grange Gorman, because that comes out as a very green area in existing maps. When Tina started to examine the street trees, um, I guess it was a surprise to us, maybe not to other people, but they fell into essentially bimodal categories. There was a set of trees that were very, very old, and you knew they were very old simply because of their sheer size. This is the circumference at breast height. And there was a set of trees then that were actually quite young. But also there was a remarkable convergence between the types of species found in the street. There wasn't a great deal of variety. There was maple lime, these magnificent London plains, and the hornbeams. It turns out that despite the fewness, the relative fewness of the London plains, they carry an enormous burden in terms of ecosystem services that they provide inside the city. 68% um, of the canopy cover is associated with those trees alone. Um, and what we were interested in doing, of course, is in tying this information to the environment and trying to figure out what type of environmental services they provide. So what we have here is uh, the estimated carbon dioxide sequestration within 10 meters of the corridor. So everything you see here represents the, essentially the CO2 consumption of these trees. And you can see clearly where the highest consumption is. It's all along those corridors where the London Plains were planted. Um, so there's a North Circular Road. You can see it along the canals here. Where the hell's it going? There. So we did some various calculations based upon the different types of trees, the total store, stored carbon, sequestered carbon, which is the annual thing, and then the total CO2 removed. And you can see overall it's the London Plains that are doing the bulk of the work. Total carbon stored, we estimate at 82%. Um, we're taking in 63% of the carbon of all the tree vegetation throughout the city. Now, I think there's an important caveat here. You can plant as many trees as you want. They will never, ever consume the amount of carbon that's coming off the urban landscape. No hope. So at best, what you're doing with the tree population is, yes, it'll take out carbon, but you're looking to plant them strategically so they get all these other benefits including, as I know David Nowak will tell us, uh, shading, uh, protection of buildings from wind forces, et cetera, et cetera, which also leads to energy savings, which also drives down the carbon emissions. So the carbon emissions. In fact, David's team in Syracuse were gracious enough to actually take all the information that Tina had provided and to actually run their software called iTree to figure out how important and what types of services the tree population that we supplied them with was doing inside Dublin. Now, there's no absolute numbers here. What we have is percents along these axes here. But you can, you can see the trees, uh, the ones that stand out, of course, is the London Plains are doing all the work. And of course, they're the ones which are oldest and probably the ones that are going to go first. And here you can see all the different types of pollutants that they are responsible for. And you can see, again, it's the London Plains that are coming out. So this tells me that if you're going to plant strategically with trees, you need to plant them routinely over a long period of time so you end up with a viable population with lots of species types and lots of age diversity. Now, another big part of what we're interested in is actually measuring the effects of trees and, broadly speaking, of the urban environment. These peculiar-looking um, instruments here are measuring what's known as the energy budget of the underlying urban surface. They're all very tall. In fact, this one here was a site graciously given to us by Dublin City. This was on top of Dublin Lighting over in um, quite an urbanised part of the city, very close to the Guinness factory. And that's about 17 metres above the ground. In other words, what it's seeing is the entire urban landscape around it. And the instruments that you see here uh, consist of these devices here. These devices here, which measure radiation, which is the natural form of radiation coming from the atmosphere. These instruments that you see here, which look like um, salad prongs, and they record very, very fast fluctuations in air movement in the atmosphere. So when you measure that alongside temperature, alongside humidity, alongside carbon dioxide, what you get is an indication of the flow of CO2 off the urban landscape. Now, these have been operating for about five years. This is very, very rare in international terms that you actually have these sites inside a city, and we have two of them, one of which is located in a city centre site, this site here, is DIT, Cabin uh, Street. So naturally we're unsure about its future given that DIT is about to move out to Grange Gorman. And this site here is the pious site I mentioned earlier where we do, took a lot of information about the surrounding vegetation. What do they show us? Well, essentially what they do is they record objectively 
the behaviour of the underlying landscape. So on a typical day, weekday in summer, notice there is the breathing pattern of the city. There's a big peak in carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere in the morning, then it falls off, a minor peak in the afternoon, then it falls off again. <clears throat> now the reason for the difference in peaks has got nothing to do with the emissions, but it's got to do with the state of the atmosphere. So as the atmosphere becomes more turbulent in the atmosphere, sorry, in the afternoon, you still get the same emissions, but the atmosphere is just better cleaning it out. Here you can see the effect of wintertime and wintertime heating. Now you can see the pattern's a little bit more complicated because there's a suburban area that relies on heating the winter. What about the weekend? Here's the weekend. You can see it's much flatter. We don't have anything like the levels of emissions that you see during the weekday. Now here's the nice one. This is a suburban site which is heavily vegetated. Notice that the net flux is out of the urban system during the daytime, sorry, during the nighttime. But during the daytime when the trees are functioning, all of a sudden the urban landscape becomes a net sink of CO2. You can see this in a bit more detail here. <clears throat> what we've done here is we've plotted the traffic emissions on the left-hand side based upon traffic counts and assumed characteristics of cars that move through this area. And on the right-hand side, there is the flow of carbon out of the urban system. Now, this is done during the summertime period. Notice that the traffic emissions would suggest a steady growth in traffic emissions over the course of the day before they collapse. Look what the trees are doing. They are taking a big, big bite of the CO2 emissions. In fact, at one point here, during the middle of the day, they're actually consuming more CO2 than that has been released from the urban environment. What else have we done? Well, this is quite a clever idea. Um, you use the leaves themselves as an indicator they're catchers of pollutants. And this is a project that, again, Tina was associated with, along with colleagues of ours in Lancaster. You take certain types of leaves and you wash off the material on those leaves. You magnetize the materials, and then after a period of time, you measure the residual magnetization still in that material. So what it does is record the metal, the ferrule um, component of magnetism on the leaf. The process is known as SIRM. And of course, the more SIRM on a leaf, the higher the, the concentration of pollutants on it. So they act like scavengers in the atmosphere. So what we did was we took selective leaves of trees at different <coughs> positions around the city. And the one I'm going to show you is actually the one around Stevens Green, not because the values are particularly high, but because I think it'll show you a very nice pattern. The highest values by far were, probably not surprising, on Dorset Street. And those poor trees in the middle of the street there are going to suffer a lot, I tell you, before they reach any sort of maturity. However, they're doing a great favour to us. They're actually capturing an awful lot of the materials coming off the adjacent traffic. So these circles here represent where the leaves came from, and the circles grow in size according to the amount of pollution associated with them. So you can see, for example, the side of Stevens Green, which is the Lewis, the vials are quite small. But you can see the sides which have traffic on it are quite high. And the other thing to notice is that the vials are highest where the traffic lights are, and that's when the cars are stopped, and that's when the fumes come out, and that's when the leaves basically capture this material. Now, I'd like you to think about this from an air quality point of view. All the evidence we have about air quality in cities indicates that a general picture of air quality bears very little relationship to the actual exposure and dosage that an individual gets walking around the streets. Uh, think about what it means for a mother with a baby in a carriage standing at a set of traffic lights. The baby in the carriage is at exactly the right height at which the pollutants are being emitted from the adjacent cars. And because everything is stopped in that traffic light, not surprisingly, there's a little plume, a little bubble of polluted air adjacent to that site. Okay, so if that's the history, where are we at now? Well, um, you can either look at tree canopy by digitizing every individual tree, which is quite difficult to do, or you engage in some form of top-down sampling process using remote sensing. Now, for the initial evaluation, I've taken an approach of sampling the urban landscape using Google Earth. And we've done it at a very, very detailed level. Uh, all those dots that you see there represent the number of points at which we evaluated the underlying urban land cover. So there's 300,000 of these across the city that we looked at. I focused only on the urban areas. In other words, I avoided the things that were large parks. And the reason for this is I want to find out what was the individual tree canopy coverage within the urbanized part of the landscape itself. 
We've seen already that Dublin consists of a city centre, an urbanised area, but then a large part of it which is effectively rural that's around it. So there's 260, 280,000 points here, and across the entire city, these are the number of points, 26,000 inside the urbanised landscape that are identified as trees. So that gives us an estimated tree canopy coverage, not necessarily number of trees, because remember, canopy depends upon the age of the tree, of about 10%. Um, there's the shrub, the grass, and you can see is about twice as high as the trees. One thing we're interested in looking at is the relationship between trees and grassland. There's the impervious, which of course is critical. If you want to find a single measure of the effect of an urban environment on the overlying urban atmosphere, it would be the proportion of the landscape that's impervious. That controls everything. Controls access to water, controls evaporation, controls hydrology of the system. So let's look at the geography of that. First of all, these trees are not equally distributed across the urban landscape. <clears throat> what I've done here is something quite simple. I've accumulated the urban area on the right-hand side, so I'm basically adding up all the information as I go along. And over here is basically 100%. And on the left hand here, I have the cumulative proportion of the landscape that's occupied by tree cover. So let's choose the 50-50 line. 50% tree cover, that occurs at 80% of the urban landscape. That means that one half the tree cover in the urbanized part of the city is captured by just 20% of the land area. There's the one-to-one -one line. So the degree of difference between these two lines indicates the degree to which the trees are not shared equally across the urban landscape. So how did I examine that? Well, on the left-hand side are all of those 26,000 dots that indicate the tree. So I need to accumulate that information to give us a geographical picture. So I took my urbanized landscape of the city I divided it up into a series of square cells, and then I counted the number of dots inside each of those cells, and what proportion of them were trees. So what does the map look like? This is what tree cover canopy across the city looks like. Remember, this is just the urbanized portion, so you can't see, um, uh, obviously, Phoenix Park and some of the large parks associated with the Dada River. Well, I think all of us can see a clear pattern here. This is like a tree divide across the city. There's a code word, as we all know in Dublin, for the leafy suburb. The leafy suburb is a code word for wealth. And you can see clearly in this part of the city here, there's a great deal of greening. The values over here uh, represent, well, uh, the yellow one is about, that's where we cross over the 50% mark. So about one half of the landscape of the city falls into the red categories, and about one half of the landscape falls into the yellows and greens. But look at the patterns associated with the red. Some of them be very familiar to us and fairly obvious. There, of course, is the airport. There is, of course, the area on the Docklands, which is, uh, I mean, having been recently developed, it's a bit disappointing just to see how devoid of trees it is. Much of the city centre, of course, is impermeable, but you see large areas over in this part of the city that are also impermeable. Let me do something simple. I have not gone into this in any detail. What I've done is I've taken what's known as the Deprivation Index. The Deprivation Index is created by an organization called Hubble. It takes 11 indicators from the census and tries to come up with a uniform measure of deprivation so they can compare places with each other. So obviously there's no question on the census that asks you, are you deprived? So what they do is they take all sorts of other measures like proportion, professional, proportional, um, educated at different levels, etc., etc. So I've divided out fairly easily. Minus 35 is about the most deprived. Plus 35 is the most affluent. I plotted out for the city, but I've um, divided up into just this, these number of categories here. So you can see clearly the areas that we'd regard generally as very prosperous, and the areas that we'd regard as less prosperous. Now the extraordinary thing about this is just how clearly correlated the deprivation map is with the tree cover map. That line that you see, the tree divide, stretching from the city centre all the way through here, corresponds almost exactly with this area here. Notice that it's even picking out the areas around Dunleary that fall into the lower categories. Interestingly, these parts of the world have now been completely transformed and are now relatively affluent. 
but they still, of course, have the historical effect of having no trees. So one thing we'd like to do is explore these types of relationships also. Now, I don't know whether this map reflects number of trees or simply the canopy coverage. We don't know whether, in fact, these areas, I have to look at it a bit more detail to see if these areas are grassland rather than tree cover, but nevertheless, the divide is quite stark. Um, I'll just show you a final piece of work that was done by a student who worked with a colleague of ours at UCD who actually interviewed about 200 individuals about their opinions about trees. Now, admittedly, the individuals were interviewed adjacent to parks, but the vast majority indicated that they thought there was far too few trees inside the city. <clears throat> so where do we intend to go with this? Well, obviously, we're going to complete our tree coverage of the city and extend it out to the wider area. The next thing to do would be to compare what we have for Dublin City and the surrounding areas against European cities, and then to actually do an evaluation of the functions of those trees, so we actually get a geographical map as to what sort of services they're providing. Now, we have a website which was on the original uh, invite, and I'll update that regularly to let you know where we're at. Thank you very much. Thank you.